In this lecture, we're going to talk about the events that took place right before the actual definition of the Immaculate Conception by Blessed Pius IX, and also some of the major controversies that attracted the attentions of great minds like St. Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and we're going to go over these not only because they're historic objections, historical objections, but indeed because they reoccur. And I think through this we also will we'll see the genius of Blessed John Duns Scotus in being able to give proper theological responses to some outstanding questions regarding the Immaculate Conception and how it relates to other Christian doctrine. Now, I mentioned in the last lecture that from Sixtus IV in 1477 up to the definition by Pius IX, from the Papal Magisterium you had a, a fundamental support and by some Holy Fathers uh, some progress in terms of a greater appreciation of what became called, uh, known as the, quote, pious doctrine, the pious doctrine. So, for example, some Holy Fathers would approve religious orders named after the Immaculate Conception, or uh, prayers uh, and granting indulgences to the praying of prayers connected to the Immaculate Conception. You also had some Holy Fathers who had to put forward some prohibitions to those who opposed the Immaculate Conception. And we'll talk about this as we talk about some of the objections. But for the time since the 15th century, and even a little time before that, up through the 18th century, you had ongoing battling regarding the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, especially regarding the idea of Mary being sanctified from the moment of conception, as we'll discuss. But let's go back to the five years before the definition. So, we're in 1849, and Pius IX is, in a, in a sad occasion of history, he's actually in exile. Why is the Holy Father in exile? Because a militant, uh, self-identified uh, Masonic organization uh, came up from the south and sought to take over the uh, Vatican and also the Papal States to such a degree that Pius IX had to flee the Vatican. Now, this is also fascinating in history because he flees to a place called Gaeta, and while he's in exile, a number of cardinals come up to him and say, Holy Father, in order to restore the papacy back to the Vatican, in order to bring order to this state of chaos with having uh, an army take over the papal states, and most of all, that the world will have, uh, again, a proper understanding of the role of Pope from his chair, Holy Father, define the Immaculate Conception. Allow Our Lady to bring her grace into this situation by honoring her with this definition. Now, this intervention by a handful of cardinals had a positive impact on blessed Pius IX, so that, once again, from exile in 1849, he writes to all the bishops of the world, asking them their opinions regarding his intention to declare the Immaculate Conception. He gets, uh, out of the 665 bishops who are contacted, 590 respond, and they respond uh, strongly favorable to the definition, encouraging the Holy Father to do this. Now, as we know, uh, the Holy Father will in fact make the definition in 1854, but the inspiration of those cardinals uh, was not without fruit because not only was the dogma proclaimed in 1854, but soon after you have the return of the Holy Father, uh, and, and it's contemporaneous to the to slightly before the dogma, and, and then uh, the fruits of the dogma are seen uh, following all the way up until 1870 at Vatican I, where you have a definition of papal infallibility. 
The point is, the proclamation of the dogma was the occasion for our Blessed Mother to bring great fruits to the church in a time of, of tremendous disarray. Uh, evidently, Italian papers were saying when Pius IX had to flee, this is the end of, of, of the church. You know, the Roman Empire had its time, and now the church is over. And this was, again, uh, a self-identified you know, Masonic uh, movement against the church. But that's the level of contempt, but also the, the, the level of dismay for the church at this time. The proclamation happens, and not only do you have a restoration of the papacy, but you have a new unity of the church under the papacy, which is also crowned by a definition of infallibility itself in 1870. So indeed, Our Lady interceded powerfully. And I think we can make this uh, a strong case that with every Marian dogma, my friends, there is untold and even historic grace released upon the church and the world because it pleases heaven when Our Lady is honored. It pleases the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when the Father's special daughter and the Son's mother and the spouse's spirit, excuse me, the Spirit's spouse, human spouse, is properly honored. It's a family victory when Our Lady is given the reverence that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit want her to have. Now, another factor that influenced the definition that happened about uh, 20 plus years before the definition was the event of the, uh, ma uh, the uh, miraculous metal apparitions. So we're in 1830, November 27th, and there is a apparition in Rudebach, in a suburb of Paris, where Our Lady comes and reveals in a message which also contains the call to stamp a medal, uh, the words, quote, I, excuse me, the, the, the words, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. These are the words inscribed around the vision which would become the miraculous medal. So, What's the point? This is a private revelation. Well, that private revelation was approved by the church and had a very favorable impact on Pius IX, uh, who, in a rather unusual uh, exercise of, of papal confirmation, made a, dir a direct papal uh, statement of approval regarding the miraculous medal. This, my friends, happens often, that private revelation, authentic private revelation, something that God the Father really ordains as a gift to the world at a given time, private revelation will confirm or direct the development of doctrine. In other words, we never look to private revelation for the foundations of any Christian truth. But private revelation has been used to guide the development of a given doctrine. Uh, a recent example is the apparitions, uh, the visions of St. Faustina uh, receiving from Jesus in what is divine mercy. Now, is, is the call of mercy not in Scripture? And we'll talk about this in the last section of the Course on, on private revelation and its purpose and its nature. Is, is mercy not in Scripture? Of course it is. Is mercy not in the teachings of the Church? Of course it is. But God wanted mercy even more emphasized in the 20th century and therefore he sends Jesus in an apparition to St. Faustina in a series of apparitions to emphasize mercy. And of course, he also had some Marian apparitions in that event as well. So private revelation is never the foundation of doctrine. Private revelation, though, can direct the church to a development of doctrine, which can include a dogmatic statement. So historically, the private revelation of the miraculous medal had a significant impact on Blessed Pius IX about the authenticity, the, the, the truth, but also the need to promulgate the Immaculate Conception. Now, there was a third factor that also encouraged Blessed Pius IX in the proclamation of the Immaculate Conception as a dogma. And this was the millions of petitions that came from people worldwide, including heads of state, asking Pius IX to declare the dogma. And here we want to talk about the legitimate use 
of petitions. We'll talk about this in, in later lectures as well. A petition to the Holy Father is not a power play necessarily. It's not trying to tell the Pope what he should do as if we are popes. It is rather more similar to the request of a child to a parent saying, this is something I would like to do. This is something I think that would be good for the family. Can we do this? It always respects the authority of the Holy Father to say no. But a good Holy Father, just like a good father of a family, is also open to the desires and petitions of the children of his family. And so millions of petitions had been sent to Blessed Pius IX by people the world over, cardinals, bishops, priests, religious lay people, and even heads of state. And in this particular case, it was the heads of state from the country of Spain that had been per, uh, particularly persistent in requesting this definition uh, of this Holy Father and even previous Holy Fathers. So we're going to see that petitions from the faithful do have a role in the Pope's discernment of a definition. Ultimately, it is the Pope's call, and ultimately the Holy Spirit will guide him. But as we have in, in, in the Code of Canon Law, that the faithful are sometimes even obliged to let the pastors of the church know things they consider important for the church. And the people at the time did so in petitioning Blessed Pius IX for this dogma. One interesting historic note, uh, the principal Vatican historian wrote of the day of the definition that it was stormy in the Vatican and, and very inclement weather. And then Blessed Pius IX appears on the platform and he relates that almost a, 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 a sunbeam, a beam of light kind of centers on Pius IX, and the storm calms, uh, and we don't want to make this Hollywood theology, but this Vatican historian is, is extremely, uh, with, with great credentials and, and uh, with a certain historic uh, critical uh, perspective. So he's, he doesn't tend, to, uh, this reputation doesn't tend to uh, inflate these things. That the weather calms, this, this light kind of appears on the Holy Father. The Holy Father gets out the words, choking back tears. And the historian concludes, so summarizing the history of the storm in the church from which this dogma comes. I, in other words, referring to the, the challenge periods that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception faced in going through this process of development which led to the actual definition. That's going to be embodied in the day, the stormy weather in the, around the Vatican uh, uh, piazza and then the victorious proclamation by Pius IX. Well, let's go back to a little bit of the historic storm of this. Let's go back to the 12th century. And in the 12th century, we have St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, St. Bernard dies in 1153. St. Bernard is arguably the single most important church figure of the 12th century. St. Bernard of Clairvaux is a doctor of Our Lady's mediation. St. Bernard of Clairvaux uh, coins the phrase de Maria numquam satis, uh, about Mary never enough. That is, you can never say too much about Our Lady. Now, of course, he would hold uh, that Latria is saying too much, but he's, he's using this phrase to talk about his impassioned love of Our Lady. And yet, St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a fiery letter to the canons of Lyon, the priests in charge of the Cathedral of Lyon, telling them not to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. At that time, the feast was known as a feast related to the celebration of Anne. Why? Why did St. Bernard write this letter to the canons of Lyon, uh, a, a letter which would have a multi-century impact in terms of confusion regarding this doctrine. And let me say also, uh, for the sake of clarity, this had not yet been established, pronounced by the church, by the pope, as a doctrine at the time. Otherwise, of course, you wouldn't have people like St. Bernard of Clairvaux or St. Thomas Aquinas uh, questioning it. This was still in the process of developing it 
and uh, developing the understanding of it as a doctrine. So technically it's not until Sixtus IV in, in 1477 makes the first official uh, papal approval in the form of, of uh, giving license to the liturgical feast that you have what we would call the clarity of the ordinary magisterium regarding the fact that this would be a doctrine. Before that, it's still unclear. So, we have St. Bernard of Clairvaux writing to the Canons of Lyon. Why does he do this? Because he says that the idea of Mary's immaculate conception cannot happen because of the way original sin is transmitted. Briefly, St. Bernard held to something that was at least in part passed on by St. Augustine, that original sin was passed on from infected body to soul. In other words, as a child was conceived, they would be contaminated by the body of the mother. And so Bernard held that while you could have a pre-sanctification of Mary in the womb, that's not a problem with that, it couldn't be at conception because at conception, Mary would be contaminated by the body of Eve. So, Bernard, the author of De Maria Nunquam Satis, didn't have a problem with the immaculate conception, you know, being, no, no, you know, you're exaggerating this, this is, this is going too far. Nothing like that. It was simply saying it doesn't fit with how original sin is transmitted. Let's leave that objection and let's go to the other major objection by St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, in no sense opposed the Immaculate Conception along the lines of the, the kind of the, the, the fiery lines of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. St. Thomas had more of a concern uh, and he posed it as a concern with the doctrine of universal redemption. Thomas was concerned that if Jesus is the universal redeemer and we hold that Mary was immaculately conceived, well, that would imply that Mary doesn't have to be saved by Jesus. And clearly, we don't want to put in question what we know to be true regarding Jesus as the universal redeemer. So, Thomas raised concern about the Immaculate Conception. He also gave a certain deference to St. Bernard, uh, a century previous to him, in light of the great uh, renowned reputation of St. Bernard. There was also some uh, reference at the time of St. Thomas to the idea that life did not begin at conception. It only began at animation possibly three months later. And so, for biological reasons, uh, the possibility of avoiding this idea of an immaculate conception. These fundamental issues which come forward from Bernard and Thomas, again, will redound and even be quoted uh, for the next five to six centuries uh, in lesser or greater degree, but it continues that long. Then what happens? Historically, we get the mind and the heart uh, of blessed John Duns Scotus. Scotus dies in 1308. Scotus becomes a professor at the University of Paris, uh, which would have the strong influence of both St. Bernard and St. Uh, Thomas. That's why uh, Blessed Don Scotus was called the subtle doctor, Dr. Satilius, because he had to subtly say, in the turf of uh, Thomas and, bon uh, Thomas and uh, Bernard, that it may be held that Mary was immaculately conceived. It may be held. Now, how does Dun Scotus respond to the objections of Bernard and Thomas? Well, first of all, Scotus says that Bernard has a mistaken idea of how original sin is transmitted. Original sin is not transmitted by a infected body infecting or contaminating the, the, the new soul. Rather, original sin is transmitted by a privation or an absence of grace at the moment of conception as a result of the original sin by Adam and Eve. That is, that God the Father, when he 
creates in terms of what's called passive uh, conception. When he infuses the soul, that soul is without grace. Why is it without grace? It's without grace because of the sin of Adam and Eve. It's a consequence, it's an effect of original sin. And that absence of grace will then have manifestations in the body, things like concupiscence and the other elements we talked about, uh, death, etc. So, the first thing that Scotus does, at least as we're talking about this systematically, is he corrects the mistaken understanding of how original sin is transmitted and shows that the immaculate conception is, in fact, not in violation, not in contradiction. It is congruous with a true understanding of how original sin is transmitted. Then, Blessed Dunscotus turns to the issue of the universal redemption. And I, and I want to emphasize this issue because it is a recurring objection. Most any time I'll do a radio show on December 8th, some caller will, will, will call and say, well, look, Mary can't be immaculately conceived because then Jesus didn't save her. So it behooves us to uh, go back to this objection. Let's, let's again, uh, articulate the objection that if, if Mary is immaculately conceived, if she's full of grace from conception, she doesn't need Jesus. Blessed Dunscotus, John Dunscotus, rightly artic articulates the uh, concept of preservative redemption. Preservative redemption is that Mary needed to be saved because she is a child of Adam and Eve, a member of the human race, and she was saved in a higher fashion than any other creature. Why? Because she never had to experience the fall. She never had to experience original sin and its effects. That grace was given to her as an application of the graces from Calvary in view of the merits of Jesus Christ. So, Mary was saved in a higher fashion than all other creatures because she didn't have to fall and then rise. She indeed was always saved from the moment of her conception. Now, uh, one, could, one could visualize this by, and it's been visualized by you know, uh, people in apologetics, by saying uh, a man you know, running up to a mud puddle, and uh, let's say he, he, he jumps in the mud, and then he, he said, well, next time I'm going to you know, get through the mud, and then I'm going to clean myself after the mud. Or I could just walk around the mud, and then I don't get dirty at all. I don't have to do the washing in that same way. I walk around. Let's say it's Jesus that brings me around the mud puddle. I think perhaps an even better uh, image would be that Jesus carries us through the mud puddle because he takes on sin for our sake, even though he doesn't commit sin himself, of course. So, it is a higher form of salvation to receive this at the moment of conception. And uh, let me just throw an, an incidental uh, distinction here. Uh, technically, and don't, please don't correct people uh, who talk about Mary being redeemed, uh, because it would be a bit sophist, but technically, Mary was not redeemed, she was saved. What's the difference? To be redeemed, that the Latin root of uh, redimire is, which uh, the, the Latin root of the term uh, redeem, which is redimire, literally means to buy back. Okay? If you redeem something, you're buying something back. Well, what happens in human redemption? Jesus buys us back. Uh, the new Adam and, uh, with the help of the new Eve, really, buys us back, right? Mary, but well, back from who? Back from Satan, back from bondage from the slavery of Satan. Well, Mary was never under that slavery. So you see, technically, Mary is not bought back, but she is saved because she receives the grace of redemption from Jesus Christ. Uh, now, a last question might be, well, how does this happen in time? Well, I want you to, I want you to imagine uh, a timeline. Uh, let's, let's say we've got a timeline uh, running, uh, uh, let's do it this way, a timeline running across this, the, the screen here, okay? Here's the beginning, here's the end. Let's say for the example that I am God. Uh, it's heretical and it's uh, too far, just, just bear with me for a moment. I am God, here's the timeline. I see the beginning, I see the end. 
and I'm outside of it, right? In fact, let's say that I create this timeline. Okay, so there's no timeline, and now I create a timeline, beginning and end. Well, I can say at this point, my son Jesus dies on the cross. Okay? I'm not going to use the, the God analogy too far here, but here's where Jesus dies. Let's say it's in the middle of the timeline. For God, it's not difficult to establish uh, a, a short period before that in time to say, okay, here's Jesus dying, here's Mary's conception, I'm going to apply grace from this event to her conception. I can apply grace from the death of Jesus and his resurrection to people before him or after him, like you and me. That's not difficult for God. So, God applies to Mary graces in view of the merits of Jesus Christ at the moment of her conception because God sees all out of time. So, as a result, we have the Immaculate Conception. We have it founded in Scripture and tradition. We have it pronounced by the ordinary magisterium, in, in this case, an extraordinary magisterium in a definition. And we have legitimate theological explanation for this beautiful doctrine and now dogma which proclaims that Mary, indeed, from the moment of conception, experiences a plenitude of grace and an absence from original sin and all its effects. Thank you.